Welcome to the premiere episode of In Focus, an Open Signal production where we spotlight nonprofit leaders in the city of Portland. In Focus is a program produced by students participating in the first Open Signal studio class of 2019. I'm your host, Sean. On today's episode, we will be joined by two special guests who will tell us about the amazing places they work. Thanks for joining us. I'd like to introduce our first guests. We have Crystal Davis and Travis Smith of Sisters of the Road. Sisters of the Road is a nonprofit cafe in downtown Portland, and we've been around since 1979, and our goal is to serve super delicious, health fresh, daily made food to folks who are potentially experiencing houselessness and or severe poverty and everyone's welcome into our space. Hmm. That's wonderful. Uh, how did you get involved with Sisters? I got involved with Sisters in about uh, 2015. I actually saw a Facebook post and a friend's like, Crystal Davis, this is you. And at the time I'd actually just injured my foot. I broke my fifth metatarsal and I'm laying in bed. I had been unemployed for months. I was barely eating anything and living with my partner. And I remember distinctly being in my bed with my laptop on my lap, looking at the Sisters of the Road website for the first time and bawling like a baby. It was everything I wanted to see happening in the world. And it was really about community. And I'm like, I have to go. I have to be there. It's beautiful. What about you, Travis? Um, a little different. Um, my mom was actually a customer at Sisters. And uh, I've been, we'd moved to Portland and we were both unhoused at the time. And she'd been dining here. And I was, I remember getting this text from her that said, stop whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing stupid check out Sisters of the Road. It's this amazing place where I got al dente pasta. And I was like, whoa, all right, what's this restaurant? We don't have money, but okay. And she was like, no, 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 it's free, but it's not free. You work for it. And I was like, that's not a real thing. What? Um, and so I, I immediately like Googled it because uh, I was curious. And also I just was like, this doesn't sound like the soup kitchens I know. Um, and when I looked into it, they were this really cool radical place that I'd seen but been a little too intimidated to go into and it turns out there's nothing intimidating about the space it's just uh I think I saw that they were treating people with dignity and I'm like nah that's not for me turns out it is it's actually for everyone and uh, that was in 2000 and let's see that was actually pretty early um when I moved to Portland in 2006 um but then 2013 um, I kind of came back to that conversation. My mom was a customer again and uh, had experienced some hard times. And uh, yeah. I, I, I uh, found the space again and I actually went in this time. And I got all that love and hospitality and, uh, and then I started working there and uh, never looked back basically. Well, this is the first show I've ever hosted and you guys almost made me cry within <laughs> the first minute and a half. Um, those are incredibly beautiful stories. Do you feel like you said um, that there was a bit of a challenge like, going in. Do you think that people struggle with guilt to even make it through the door or concern? Or do you find that people are really open to receiving these services? I think what I've learned at Sisters is that everyone has such a unique story that like there's guilt, there's shame, there's fear, there's joy, there's every kind of emotion coming through that door. Um, our, one of our founders, Jenny Nelson, would always say it all comes through the door. And I think Sisters is really unique in that it's there for that. Where, I mean, you know, I, I have a job now. I have a lifestyle that's pretty, like, easy. I don't, I don't face as many challenges as I used to. And I still can't say there's any place other than Sisters that, like, accepts me that way. You know, I can go to a coffee shop or a bar or a hotel or wherever I want now because I have currency. But when I go to Sisters, I actually get community, and that's pretty pretty unique so I think it's yes all that comes through the door and then it's pretty much met with a hug immediately so right sisters of the road is very much about like being your authentic self and literally building authentic relationships is in every single job description at sisters and so wherever folks are when they're coming through the door we're there and that's where you meet them right absolutely right. that's great how many people do you serve on a given day we serve about 230 people every day uh, do you have like a pounds per day, pounds per year? We get that a lot, um, which is a, is a great question. We need to report for grants so that information is helpful. 
Um, but it's, I also think it's funny because nobody's asking restaurants how many pounds they're serving per year. Um, and we're a restaurant. We're a restaurant for folks who come in and they'll either pay with fat cash, food stamps, or by working for the meals. And so, yeah, we probably, tons of pounds of food uh, <laughs> go to our customers. And at the same time, we like to make sure that each plate is beautifully presented and has as much or as little food as a person wants. So speaking of which, what's the kind of range of food options that you could walk into on a random Tuesday? What are what are people seeing on, available on the menu? Oh my gosh, well today was lasagna mm. with salad, really lovely rolls too. We like to have uh, fruit, like a salad on every plate. Um, let's see, Thai curry was earlier this week, a Thai curry soup. Yeah, we have specials every day um, mm -hmm. that change. We like to repeat certain things like grilled cheese and tomato soup. Oh Burgers gosh, are so popular. <laughs> Um, quinoa bowls, that sort of thing. Um, but we also always have our number two, uh, which is our rice, beans, and cornbread. We've had that since we opened in 1979. Same recipe, I'm told, even. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a pretty easy meal to make vegetarian. It's automatically vegetarian. You can make it vegan. Um, and then we also always have a side of salad that's, uh, with options in dressing, hard-boiled eggs, mm -hmm. coffee, juice, coffee. More coffee. More coffee. <laughs> Standard staples beyond modern dishes. It sounds like you guys are really taking great care of people. Uh, what are the hours of operation and days of operation? Mm -hmm. We're open from Tuesday through Saturday, and we open our doors at 9.15 for folks to start signing up for reservations for the day. And we uh, started our time slot system or our reservation system such that folks wouldn't need to queue up and wait in a huge line mm -hmm. over the course of the day waiting to get their meal. Is, has technology changed that practice at all in your time there? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, technology and our community are not always hand in hand. Um, so it hasn't changed as much as people might think. Um, we still have our basic reservations. Right. We still do a lot of things with pencil and paper mm -hmm. because that's what works best for how we function. Makes sense. Uh, how can somebody get more information about your organization? Mm -hmm. Well, folks can definitely go to sistersoftheroad.org and every third Thursday, third Thursday? Yeah. Third Thursday. We have our volunteer orientation and it's also an opportunity for folks to really be in the space to learn what our different barter positions look like and that's folks who are being hosts in the space and earning barter credit which they can then purchase a meal with. So there, there are a lot of ways. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you like the people you work with? We love the people we work with. We are a really soppy bunch, and one of our biggest asks is that we have Kleenex in our meeting room. <laughs> yeah, I can see how that would be a necessity <laughs> in like 10 minutes with you guys. And I think to expand <laughs> outside of that too, you know, we don't just work with staff. Like we are a pretty small organization. We have what, 20 staff at a time? About 23. 23 right now. Um, but the work that gets done in the cafe is predominantly done by our customers, by our community folks who are volunteering their time for meals, um, but more often than not, they're volunteering their time just to be there, to make the space run, to make it happen. Um, just like any volunteer, and they're getting meals out of it, and that's great, but I get to work with the most dedicated people I have ever met in my entire life, and they're not on payroll. So it's pretty magical. Also, the staff are incredible, obviously. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> have you seen any changes with who's coming in uh, due to rapid gentrification or displacement, rising rents, uh, economical struggles that people have been experiencing? I think we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of difference. And usually, that for us, I find it to be more seasonal. Mm -hmm. During the summer months, folks are traveling to different climates and vice versa for the summer. Portland's kind of soppy in the winter seasons. So I feel like folks are trying to go where the climate is most accommodating, but Portland does have a lot of like very interesting and intriguing services. And simultaneously, Sisters is located in like Old Town, Chinatown area, and there is a lot of gentrification. The Pearl District seems to be expanding more and more daily. And I, I think there's a lot of difference to how folks are treated by our surrounding neighborhood. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, our, our neighborhood, Northwest Six and Davis, um, 
so it was considered a resource hub, um, but with Right to Dream 2, the, uh, the camp for folks who were unhoused, the kind of tent city that was there, mm -hmm. um, that went out, um, was, was forced out, sorry. Uh, and so when things like that happen, our community has to travel further. So folks were sleeping right next to us. That was awesome. And now I'm seeing regulars less and less frequently because they don't want to walk an hour to get to us. Right. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's changed the climate a bit. What are you hoping to see over the course of the next handful of years, the next three to five? Uh, are there any changes you see on the horizon? Well, we're at a really exciting moment in Sisters history. Uh, previously, years ago, around uh, the 2011 to 2013 time range, we had more of a traditional structure. And then staff at the time and the community at the time decided that let's try collectivity and see what that feels like for us. We've, or at the time the folks who were there for it felt like that was something that really um, worked with the values that we try to hold of nonviolence and anti-oppression. And over the years we were able to experience that and see what worked best for our organization and community. And now through that we've decided that it is helpful to have somebody who's holding like the main responsibility. So recently we onboarded, recently being this time last year, <laughs> right? <laughs> time flies when you're having fun, um, but we onboarded our first executive director in the years, Danielle Clock, who is amazing and vivacious, is, has so much energy and love to bring to sisters. One thing I've heard her um, say time and time again that really uh, is why I still work there, um, is that everything should come from the community first. Um, mm -hmm. So even though we changed from kind of a flat hier or a flat um, structure to something that looks a little bit more hi like hierarchy, mm -hmm. um, the idea is that everyone has a voice, everyone has an experience, and everything is relationship. So our executive director it makes sure that everyone mm -hmm. is valued in that experience of being basically being a person, which is really nice and rare, I feel. Uh, just why it took a little while to find someone, but when we did, I think we, we found a good one. Yep. So I feel like I could spend another half hour talking with you guys. Uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, start winding it down. So I want to make sure we address uh, how can somebody go about volunteering? Uh, who do they contact? What's the process for helping out with Sisters of the Road? So on any given day, folks can come in and sign up to do barter work in the cafe for up to two hours a day. Um, we also have a volunteer orientation once each month on those third Thursdays. And um, mm -hmm. it's great to check our events calendar. Go to sistersoftheroad.org mm -hmm. um, and just check our events. And yeah, the volunteer orientation is a great way to get involved. But also just stop by. Don't be like me. Don't wait so long to go through those precious <laughs> doors. <laughs> can, you, can you say it right to the people? Come into <laughs> Sisters. It's amazing. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. It was wonderful to meet both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I hope to talk with you again soon. And we're back with In Focus, an Open Signal studio production. And here we are with Amy Sachs, the director of the Pixie Project. How are you doing, Amy? I'm doing great. All right. Can you tell us uh, what the Pixie Project does? Absolutely. So we are just right down the road on MLK and we serve two purposes. Number one is a more personalized matchmaking approach to adoption. So we do dogs and cats and we focus on really getting to know our animals using certified trainers to assess behavior and fantastic veterinarians to assess medically. And then we get to know the families that are looking for animals and we really help facilitate matches. And then we offer a lot of support, training information, pre and post adoption. We really try to facilitate good, good pairs and then be there to support them so they can have long-term success. And the other side of what we do is a small low cost surgical clinic. Mm -hmm. So we offer low cost spay and neuter to low income community members. So anybody who has um, a pet that needs spay and neuter or some sort of medical treatment that would force them to give it up, we have a sliding scale and offer those services so that rather than having to lose a long time companion, someone can seek resources through us and we can help get them over that hump and keep their pet with them. How long have you been serving the community? 
So we've been around for 11 years, but we were much smaller, but we just saw the need for that clinic. So we've been doing adoption for about 11 years, uh, but on a much smaller scale for the first five. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we expanded after five years and then added the clinic as well. We just were getting a lot of phone calls to be to help people's pets. And honestly, I felt very sad about it. There was clearly a need and there were pets that I felt would be so much better off not entering the shelter system and very dedicated, loving owners who had found themselves on hard time. So we've been doing that now for about four years, the clinic. That's great. So you're the director of, of uh, the Pixie Project, but you also started this. What's the origin story? So I grew up in an animal loving house. I would say an animal and people loving house. Um, and we were uh, always charity focused and community focused. And we knew all of the local homeless people's pets. We had relationships with them, made sure that their pets were cared for. We would get them to the vet if they needed to. We always had shelter pets. So I was made very aware of those needs in the community from a young age. Uh, you said when we were talking before uh, that your parents are involved. Uh, obviously, they set you on a track looking out for people, looking out for animals. You said that the, there was, they'd have stuff in the car, like stuff for homeless people and their animals. Uh, what's their involvement now? Yeah, so exactly. We, we always had like human socks <laughs> and dog beds and dog food. So there was, you know, um, always they still do. Uh, I still do. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry, what? No, what, it's okay. What, what? Uh, your parents involved. Oh, right. So um, my mom and dad are uh, basically the president and vice president of the board. So, um, and my brother's on it as well. So it's obviously uh, very much a family affair. Um, they support us um, financially with some resources. They support us from a business standpoint because they are both business people. So as a young director, it's very helpful to have that guidance um, mm. in the family and externally with our board. And um, yeah, I provide, they provide emotional support when this world of nonprofit can make you a little batty sometimes. So they're really, uh, it's, a, it's a family effort for the community for sure. Do you have any ambitions to spread within the community or beyond the community? I think right now in our community, we are limited only by our finances so we just can't afford for example to operate more than one day a week in our mm -hmm. surgical clinic which means we do have a wait list as we're the only surgical low-cost option which is challenging um, but uh, i would like to raise more money uh, and then when we do that uh, we can look at expanding the model so i would really like to think that pixie project I know it's needed in every community, a kind of a smaller scale, more focused, more supported approach to adoption, as well as the low cost community clinic. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's needed everywhere. So my goal would be to, you know, build the brand and in doing so help many, many more people and animals. That's great. Uh, what are the kind of ranges of services that you provide as far as the surgical clinic? Like, yeah. Interesting question. <laughs> We're gonna go um, back. Yeah, so we do um, everything. So obviously spay and neuter is mm -hmm. super important. So we provide access to spay and neuter for anybody's pets, regardless of their ability to pay. Um, some people can, some people can't, that's okay. I We don't need more puppies and kittens in the world. We have plenty. So um, that's a big focus and then there's other things that are unfortunately more laborious, but very important in terms of keeping people and pets together. So things like dentals and um, even we can do like amputations and eye removals and all kinds of weird things that dramatically affect the quality of life of the animal. Um, and once you have a nice efficient system down, you can offer very high quality care and keep your costs lower through being strategic. Makes sense. Uh, wh what's it like if somebody watching out here wants to volunteer? What what process is involved? Yes, yeah, so we have a fantastic volunteer coordinator named Becca. She's wonderful. And she also is our front desk coordinator and also a halftime cat coordinator. <laughs> so we wear a lot of hats. Um, and you just send an email to her. Mm -hmm. We have several trainings a month. And she'll take you through the general training about Pixie. And then there's one training specific to dog walking and one specific to cattery volunteers. Those are the two main roles. Mm -hmm. And then we have people that do events. We have people that love to do office work, bless them. 
we have you know all kinds of different ways that people like to contribute and becca is really the center of all of that and she's fantastic at utilizing our volunteers and utilizing various skill sets and engaging them in our community so it's great it's it's a lot of fun and we make it very accessible it's it's just a google calendar and you can go on and it's a sunny day today i want to walk a dog or you know i want to jump in next week and help out in the cattery try to make it something that people don't feel you know they feel a sense of pride and responsibility and community but that it's not a you know too much weight and that way it can include sure. more people what would you say your biggest need from the community is money money straightforward we need money <clears throat> we're offering the only place that if your animal gets hurt and you need to be supported in that i mean it, it just it really does i mean things like donations of medications when pets pass away mm -hmm. um, donations of supplies dog and cat you know food primarily wet food those things are very helpful you know encouraging your local little bar to do a night where a dollar from a pint of a particular beer goes to Pixie Project. There's lots of little things that are, even just right now, we have Ava Jean and Tusk, which mm -hmm. are two restaurants in the city. They're each doing a specialty cocktail in all of February. So a dollar from each of those goes to us. You know, that's a fun little thing. We have bars that will do trivia nights. We have, you know, all different ways. And if they raise $100 or if they raise $1,000, that's great. And it's also, engaging the community and talking about pixie and more importantly about rescue right. so you know looking at businesses that you support and seeing if they might want to support us and a lot of times it's cool because it facilitates the conversation and people might say oh yeah my friend adopted from there or, hey they really helped my neighbor when they needed it and those are positive conversations to have and all of that just honestly spreads the love yeah. which is really what we want to be a welcoming warm loving place and it's, it seems like there are so many animal lovers there's so many people that care about the well-being of people that if more people were just discussing you through some of these creative partnerships it would only be it's beneficial only positive exactly right so to turn it cute for a second how do you name the animals that uh, are sheltered totally a cute question super valid some of them obviously come with names um but we it just depends on the day of the week. Like we'll throw it out there and then somebody's feeling creative that day and somebody's not so much. Um, so it, we kind of, in the summer when we have litters of kittens, we always go with themes, mm -hmm. you know, candy bars, board games, what, you know, silly things like that. Um, but yeah, it's kind of whoever's feeling, whoever's feeling clever that day. Great. Uh, I think that you sent over some pictures our way. Uh, we did, Can we yes. throw to the video yes. for that and check a out some cuteness? Maximum cuteness, yes. Perfect. back in the studio those were uh, some wonderful cutesy pictures do you have a uh, did you compile the images yourself I did along with one of my cat coordinators and one of my dogs so uh, before we get out of here can you tell us about any upcoming events that you might have where people can get involved totally we have two big events a year so we have a big auction every November which is super fun and um, coming up sooner in uh, not we don't have the date quite yet we'll have it this week um, but in the end of June we have Pixie Prom which is super fun and we always have a live band and we have it at the Spirit of 77 right next door to Pixie Project and basically we just dance and drink and have a lot of fun so Beautiful. that's a good that's a good way to come support us come booze it up and eat and celebrate Pixie and that's that's the best way All right. it's a fun way Cool. Well, thank you, Amy. It's been great Absolutely. talking to you. Thank you. I uh, love for what you're me. doing, and uh, I hope that you can spread this across the country. And in the meantime, thanks for uh, taking care of the people and pets of Portland. Thank you so much. Thanks All for right. giving me the chance to talk. Nice to meet you.
And that's it for today's show. If you would like to know more about how you can be a part of next episode of this series, find us on the web at www.opensignalpdx.org. You can also give us a call during our public hours by simply dialing 503-288-1515. Or you can even stop by for more information by visiting us at 2766 Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard with the entrance on Graham Street. Thank you for watching. Open Signals in focus.